Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see that. All good. So welcome everyone. This is the first seminar between Monash and um, UTS. And the idea of this seminar came after um, several talks uh, between myself uh, and Professor Haibu from um, the Monash University. And we realized that there are so many topics in common between uh, the two universities and especially around the topic of artificial intelligence for transportation applications. Um, as you know, at the moment, AI is a very popular and it's gaining more and more interest from the scientific community. And the transportation as well is being, um, is being part of this whole wave. So for today's um, seminar, we thought of sharing our work from the two institutions. Um, so we are going to start by giving you a short introduction of each university and um, the Transportation uh, Institute. So Professor Haibu will give a short introduction about the Monash Institute of Transport Studies. Uh, I will follow up to tell you more about the UTS Future Mobility Lab, which is inside the UTS Data Science Institute. And then we have our four speakers aligned. Uh, our first, the first speaker is from UTS, um, Arthur Grigorev, and um, he is going to talk about his work um, around the traffic incident duration prediction using advanced machine learning. We are going to follow up with the speaker from Monash, Bo Wang. He's going to talk about uh, the short-term traffic flow prediction in bike sharing networks using 3D ResNets. Our second speaker is Sanghyeon, currently lecturing uh, in, at UTS, and he's going to talk about the behavior model of heterogeneous low-carb traffic flow. And also, the second speaker from Monash, Humayun, um, is going to talk about the identification of evolving bottlenecks in transportation networks. As we go, I'm going to introduce with a short biography each of the speakers, and then they have uh, 20 minutes for presenting their work, following by 10 minutes Q&A with questions from your side or questions that might appear in um, the chat uh, room. Uh, I'll pass now on to you, Professor Haibu, to provide a short introduction to the Monash Institute of um, Transport Studies. Okay, thank you. Uh... Thank you, Simona, uh, for the introduction and also for uh, the initiative um, in uh, organizing this uh, seminar series. Um, uh, I think this will be one of the first uh, seminar series between the two groups, between uh, UTS and Monash uh, Institute of Transport Study. Uh, and I hope that uh, we will have more uh, in the future. So um, let me just share my screen um, to talk a little bit about the um, Monas Institute uh, of Transport Studies. So this is more of the introduction uh, into uh, uh, the Institute of Transport Study at Monash. And um, uh, I will also uh, direct you to the link uh, on the website where you could uh, also see more information. Okay. So can you see my screen here? Yes, okay. we can see. So, yeah, so... Um, so Monash Institute of Transport Studies is one of the um, part of the key uh, 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 ex uh, research excellent research center by the ARC established um, um, 50 years ago, uh, which uh, uh, Monash Institute of Transport Studies is one of the node. Uh, another one is the uh, Institute of Transport and Logistics Studies uh, in the University of Sydney. Uh, currently, I'm the director of the, this institute. Um, 
previously uh, was Professor Zeb Rose, uh, who recently um, uh, scaled back to part high in preparatory retirement. So this is the website uh, where you could uh, looking at more detail of the, the information, uh, including the, the list of the member and affiliation member of uh, the institute, also some of our uh, research activity. Now, what I'm going to uh, going through some of the uh, snapshot today is really uh, give a, a short introduction into the, the some of the presentation that our student will give uh, in later within this seminar um, today. So this you um, this is the the research area and the capability of the Monas uh, Institute of Transport Studies uh, that we currently cover. Uh, you can see the four different pillars, uh, including the Interesting Transport System, the Advanced Technology, uh, Future Mobility, uh, the Active Travel, Micro Mobility, and Public Transport. Now, the topic that we, we cover today is the, um, the upper uh, of this figure, so primarily around uh, intelligent transport system and also advanced technology uh, because it's related to data and uh, artificial intelligence. Now, uh, it's also very important to recognize that uh, MONAS uh, ITS or Institute of Transport Studies also cover an area that link these four pillars together and you can see in the middle uh, where we're looking at both the demand the supply and also policy uh, settings for transportation so uh, from the demand perspective uh, we cover the uh, behavior mobility behavior and also the management of demand why on the supply is more of uh, how to efficiently manage the existing infrastructure. So a little bit into more detail of what we um, cover within the intelligent transport system and advanced technology, you can see uh, in this um, breakdown here, where um, the topic of uh, decision support system, for example, the use of data and AI, uh, is the topic of today, uh, why the advanced technology, uh, including uh, AV technology, connected vehicle, um, and also share mobility might be uh, in the future um, uh, topic for us to explore. Okay, so let me just go uh, very quickly, uh, some of the uh, snapshot to uh, give you a an idea of what I mean by uh, those uh, uh, area that I share. So in, in the data and AI area, um, we're looking at traffic estimation, which um, related to the presentation that Paul will give uh, later today, decision support system, and also transport network evaluation. So for traffic estimation, the idea here is to using machine learning and transport domain knowledge to improve the performance of short-term traffic forecasting. Uh, in, in this example, we are looking at that how to utilize, um, for example, the relationship of um, uh, temporal and spatial, uh, uh, and also to understand that how those relationship is relevant uh, from the transport perspective. So you can see at the bottom left, the fundamental diagram uh, in, in the 3D that um, uh, basically can be re-established um, from, uh, from the machine learning um, training uh, uh, architecture perspective. Uh, decision support system is basically uh, a kind of platform where we're using data and AI to support uh, decision making. Uh, it could be day-to-day uh, -day operation, but it could be also for short-term planning or, um, uh, uh, or managing some of the 
uh, traffic incident or accident, for example. And uh, the last one that I want to mention today is looking at the overall network from the uh, res resilient perspective. So for my own, we touch on this uh, briefly today uh, because he will more focusing on the data and AI side. But uh, basically, uh, this is uh, one of the methods that uh, he uh, developed to understand uh, that how the network um, is, is uh, robust um, uh, in terms of delivery, the, the service that it set out to, um, to be. Okay, so I think with that, uh, I would like to just, um, stop here uh, because really it's that, uh, about the introduction of the ITS and also giving you some really uh, brief introduction into the topic that we covered today. Thank you, Simona. Thank you, Professor, for the introduction of the Monash Institute of Transport and it's really good to have this large overview. I will further take on and share a little bit about the Future Mobility Lab and the UTS Data Science Institute. I think a lot of people are not familiar with it and it would be good. So let me just share my screen. Just give me a second. All right, can you see the screen? Yeah, all good. Right. So, the Future Mobility Lab um, is actually a new lab created um, two and a half years ago at um, the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. Uh, it was created as part, uh, as part of a large initiative of the faculty to increase the capability of applying um, data science and artificial intelligence solutions to solve uh, real world problems. By real world problems, we mainly refer to anything that touches our life. The way we move, uh, the way we live in the city that uh, we are, um, the way we make decisions and so on. So um, a little bit about myself, for those that do not know me, I'm currently a senior lecturer. My role is to lead this new Future Mobility Lab and give possibilities for new young talents to apply, learn, um, and uh, explore new possibilities. I'm mostly interested in transport modeling. We're driving the incident management direction for quite a few years. And uh, also we are trying to expand um, all of this, not only to be AI focused driven, but mostly to, to include all sorts of optimization um, techniques that can be applied to solve our daily problems. Um, UTS is well known in Australia. For those that might be watching this from internationally, um, is one of the top ranked universities in um, several rankings. And recently we got um, a very good number one computer science ranking that shows the great capability in, in AI and computer science. So the hard work and the strategy that the university took several years ago is finally starting to show up, and especially in, in computer science. And um, this is a stand-up proof that we're growing. Um, the Data Science Institute, as I was telling you, was created with this whole purpose. And basically to deliver a full suite of integrated services for all sorts of um, clients, either industrial clients, government um, uh, agencies, and so on. Uh, currently it has more than 35 full-time researchers. Um, and um, a lot of PhD students that are working in various areas. Um, they, they are basically, there are some, how should I say, acknowledgement and awards that the Data Science Institute has received so far. And two of our members, Professor Fang Chen and also Lombi Kao are one of the most um, well-known um, winners of the Eureka Prize. And this represents uh, quality of the personal working inside the Data Science Institute uh, that are making all their efforts for impact. Uh, UTS has also worked class infrastructure um, and is currently equipped with several 
um, units, like the Dada Arena, which is a 360 degree visualization um, immersive room. It's extremely powerful. Um, we have also set up what we call the new Predator Lab, uh, where we have high powerful Acer computers that are being used for a total immerse, immersion inside virtual reality environments and so on. Um, so a little bit about the teams that the Data Science Institute is working, as I was telling you to apply artificial intelligence. Uh, we are touching a lot of all, like all the major domains out there, water, energy, finance, transportation, and this is me here and my team and the ones that some of them you're going to see today, healthcare and so on. So all of a sudden is like, how can we apply all the knowledge that we have gathered so far, um, not only from the AI side, the data science side, but to actually give some solutions to, to all sorts of industrial players out there that have, have various problems, but at the end of the day, the Data Science Institute um, has basically similar techniques that can be applied to all sorts of, of, of problems. So the Future Mobility Lab um, inside the Data Science Institute um, has been focusing so far, for example, on applying machine learning for traffic disruptions. And you're gonna hear today Arthur's work around that, how we have done it. This is incident management is a large topic that we are passionate about because it's a hard problem to solve and a lot of transport agencies do not know how to handle uh, disruptions in an efficient and fast way. Um, we are focusing a lot on multimodal traffic simulations. We've, we've been working on all sorts of levels, macro, meso, micro, applied to either airports, trains, you name it. So all sorts of um, areas where this is needed. Um, we've, been, we've been building as well several public transport analytics and optimization platforms. We are currently monitoring in real time all the public transport movement in Sydney, and we are building all sorts of optimization techniques to reduce the dwell time, for example, or the delay between stops. Um, the traffic flow prediction using AI, so um, maybe this will be covered in a later seminar. We have applied all sorts of deep learning methods to be able to predict um, how much is going to be the traffic flow around motorways uh, and so on. And also around smart city modeling, we are passionate about the urban evolution of cities, how people move, how people are impacted by social uh, economic factors, and basically how can we help them. We are also focusing on electric vehicles, and we've been doing um, uh, last year a piece of work with IEMO, the Australian Electric Market Operations, to model the impact of EVs in Australia on our roads and um, not only from an energy consumption but from a transport consumption as well. We are also working with iMove on road safety in order to build an automatic tool for automatic road start rating. This is by combining a lot of road of, uh, attributes and to in order to be able to have this automatic um, rating of how safe are the roads that we are traveling on. This is extremely important for road safety and also of course as a lot of you have been, have been um, working on uh, studying the impact of COVID on public mobility. Um, that being said, there are also PhD thesis available. These are just listed here uh, around the usage of AI, the modeling of EVs, connected vehicles we're also passionate about. And also one other topic that we're passionate about is around the virtual reality for improving road safety and traffic optimization. So, we are trying to grow and expand our capabilities in all these domains. And with that being said, um, this is the short introduction of the um, Future Mobility Lab, and I'm happy to take more questions as we go. Um, if all is good, we can start with the first uh, speaker uh, for today. So Arthur, Arthur Grigorev, uh, he's currently a PhD student uh, in our future mobility lab. And um, he is originally from um, Itmo University. He finished his Bachelor in Computer Science at Itmo University in Russia, St. Petersburg. And um, he is actually interested in applying all sorts of machine learning, all sorts even of computer vision methods to do traffic analysis, incident impact management, 
So today you're gonna hear about his work in machine learning in order to predict the traffic incident duration. Uh, and that being said, I will stop my sharing here and I will hand over to Arthur to share his slides and start the presentation. Do you hear me? All good. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Artur Grigoriev and I'm a second year PhD student at University of Technology Sydney. Uh, topic of today's presentation is traffic incident duration prediction using advanced machine learning, which is related to uh, first stage of my research. Uh, we will discuss introduction to this topic, uh, research area overview. I will uh, show stage planned stages of my research, also data methodology and results. I will describe intra extra joint optimization which I propose, and also I will show possible application of the research. Why is it hard to model incidents? First, they are random, and also they can last from one minute to 24 hours. The clearance depends on congestion and they cost a lot of money. Traffic incident uh, include, includes different types of uh, traffic incidents uh, like uh, police or ER operation, hazards, signal faults, breakdowns, but majority of traffic incidents are traffic accidents. What is traffic incident? <clears throat> Traffic incident is a stochastic event in traffic network which causes non-recurrent traffic congestion. Traffic incident has multiple time intervals, phases. Uh, as you see on our graph, uh, first uh, phase is detection and reporting of incident. It's a time interval between incident occurrence and incident notification. Then is um, response time. It's a time interval between uh, reporting and arrival of the first investigator at the location of the accident. And then there is clearance time. <clears throat> it's time interval between the first uh, investigator uh, appearance and uh, clearance of the accident. <clears throat> research area overview. Traffic incident analysis is challenging because um, uh, non-recurrent congestion caused by traffic incident is difficult to predict because it has stochastic nature. There is a high diversity of, of studies. Researchers analyze only a specific kind of road network like motorway, highway, or freeway. Researchers also analyze primarily specific kind of incident phase, detection, response, clearance, or total time. And uh, each re research has different set of variables, uh, like weather factors, waiting conditions, and incident reports, which also appear to be different uh, in uh, different countries. There are small data set sizes uh, for majority of studies. And uh, usually, uh, incident durations for skew di distributions like work normal. And um, our research contribution is to make universal framework for traffic incident analysis adaptable, adaptable to different kinds of road networks and different sets of variables. The most similar research to my research uh, is um, predicting duration of traffic accidents based on cost-sensitive Bayesian network and weighted k nearest neighbor <coughs> by Kuang, published in 2019. Uh, there are <coughs> research gaps, like they used only one method for classification and only one method for regression. Uh, near, by Bayesian network and uh, k nearest neighbors. They used static duration threshold, which separates uh, short-term and long-term traffic accidents. Uh, they used it uh, because they tried to avoid a class imbalance problem. 
and they don't use outlier removal. Uh, my research contribution is to use is to test multiple machine learning models. Second is to determine best threshold for each data set. And third, to include outlier removal with joint optimization. Stages of my research. Uh, first year of my research devoted to incident duration prediction using machine learning based on incident reports. Second year is going to be um, special temporal incident impact estimation, including potential impact map and estimation of special temporal life cycle of disruption. Third year uh, plan to be devoted to simulation based modeling for response plan and incident clearance strategy. Stage one, incident duration prediction. In my research, I try to predict durations of traffic incidents on three different data sets. First is uh, Victoria Road subnetwork, which represents arterial roads, uh, which includes 574 incidents. Second data set is uh, traffic accidents on M7 motorway. It includes uh, 7,194 uh, accidents. And third one is an excerpt from a very large uh, data set published recently, which includes 2.25 million records on traffic accidents in USA. Uh, I extracted the area for extracted traffic accidents for San Francisco area, and it includes 8,754 accidents. We can predict incident duration using machine learning. There are different methods for classification, regression, and outlier removal. There are different approaches uh, to model tuning and validation and uh, feature importance estimation. This is data profiling for these three data sets. And uh, we see that all three data sets include uh, specific outliers. For Victoria Road Network, arterial roads, we have zero and one minute duration accidents. For Amazon Motorway, we have also large amount of zero and one minute accidents. And for San Francisco data set, we have uh, rounded durations of traffic accidents like 29 minutes yeah 29 minutes and 360 minutes this is data structure for traffic accidents on sydney arterial roads and m7 motorway we have location hour of day when incident started um, day of the week, we can't all time related variables, incident subtype, which describes uh, type of vehicle involved in traffic accident, number of affected lanes, direction of traffic, um, and these uh, uh, parameters, like average temperature. And for arterial roads, we also have uh, section properties, like section ID, speed, lanes, and class of section. We propose below framework structure, which includes regression and classification uh, approaches. So we have data as an input, and we, need, we try to find uh, best low duration auto removal threshold. Uh, and best duration split threshold, which splits uh, traffic and, uh, accidents on short term and long term. Then uh, we utilize this low duration removal threshold and best duration split threshold for different regression scenarios. When we analyze 
extra uh, extrapolation ability of different machine learning models. For example, to, uh, we try to train our model on short-term traffic inc incidents and try to predict duration of long-term traffic incidents. And we find best uh, machine learning model for each scenario. We use incident reports to predict the class of the incident duration. <clears throat> Traffic uh, accident can be short term and long term, and uh, we need to find best threshold to split between short term and long term incidents, and also to be able to predict will it last below some threshold. For example, will it last below 45 minutes or it will last longer. We use incident reports to predict the exact duration of the incident. And uh, there may be a deviation from uh, exact duration when we try to predict it. We also uh, try to construct Belio framework, which consists, consists of two stages. First stage is to perform classification of traffic accidents into short-term uh, incident or long-term incident category. Then we try to perform uh, regression using machine, le machine learning models to predict exact duration of this is a short-term or long-term incident. Our task is to predict class of traffic uh, incident. Um, it, our task is to predict class of uh, traffic accident duration uh, using incident report. We perform uh, binary classification, uh, which suppresses short term and long term traffic accidents and multi-class classification, which includes short, mid-term, and long-term incidents. And we also try to perform regression. Classification results. So for all three data sets, we try different thresholds from 20 to 70 minutes. And we look at F1 score metric uh, to analyze quality of uh, classification. We set 0 0.75 uh, as acceptable F1 score. And um, for example, for artery roads, which is data set A, uh, we select a threshold 40 minutes, which uh, shows 0 0.79 F1 score. And also, uh, there are 66% of data below this threshold. And uh, we see that the best performing model is ha uh, hard to determine, but it is a uh, KNN, uh, in this case, or XGBoost for second dataset M7 motorway. We select threshold 45 minutes, 65% uh, of data below this threshold. So this classification is uh, close to be balanced. And for San Francisco, we select threshold uh, 45 minutes, which splits data into 45 and 55 minutes. We also try to perform outlier removal. We try to remove traffic uh, incident with duration for example, zero minutes, below, uh, one minute and below, two minutes and below. And uh, we see that we can easily remove traffic incidents with duration below five minutes and maintain acceptable F1 score with a removal of only 8% of data for arterial roads data set. For Amazon motorway, we can remove only zero and one minutes, and uh, we already have F1 score 0 
which is very close to, to acceptable, but we can go further. And for San Francisco, we have very specific outliers, <coughs> which are represented as rounded traffic incident durations, like 29, 360, 29, and uh, 360 traffic uh, incident durations combined. So if we try to remove 29 minus traffic incidents, we remove 27% of data, which is a lot. And we can't remove almost 40% of data based only on assumptions that these are outliers. We consider this to be a property of the data set and we decided to leave these outliers for our experiments. We also perform multi-class classification. We split data into three equally sized parts and we use F1 macro score, which is just average F1 score across uh, three different classes. And we see that we can't use three class uh, split, we can't use multi class classification for datasets, uh, arterial roads, and M zone motorway, but we can use it for San Francisco. It uh, has 0.72 F1 score. F1 microscope. Yeah. <clears throat> then we go to regression scenarios for data set uh, arterial roads. Uh, there are different scenarios. Subset A represents short term traffic incidents, subset B represents long term traffic incidents, and O represents all tra traffic incidents. For example, scenario A to A, we use short-term traffic incidents to train model and try to predict on uh, short-term, to predict duration of short-term traffic incidents. And uh, we have 51.2% maybe. And when we try to use long-term incidents to predict uh, duration of long-term incidents, we also have 32.2% maybe. <clears throat> but when we try to extrapolate the train model on short-term traffic incidents and try to predict on long-term traffic incidents, we have uh, significant increase in the error as if uh, in comparison to pre prediction only long-term tra traffic incidents. For example, B2B is 32% maybe less is better um, and uh, for a to b scenario we have 63 percent maybe which uh, represents a doubled error and uh, also the best regression model is XG boost across multiple scenarios and also the rest scenario o to a and o to b in which we use all the data for training and regression, regression models and evaluate the prediction on each fold within subset A. So it means that we use data on short term traffic incidents, on long term traffic incidents, but also we add uh, data on short term traffic incidents. And we compare these scenarios B to A and O to A. So we added additional data into our training set and error decreased. But when we try to use just A to A regression, we have a bit lower error. And for scenario O to B, we have 38% maybe. But it's much better to use just subset B and to predict on subset B. A very similar situation is for data set M7 motorway. Uh, XGBoost is also the, the best performing model, <clears throat> and uh, we see that A to A scenario is much better than O to A scenario, and B to B also much better than O to B. It means we should analyze uh, each, we should 
train our models on each traffic incident duration subset separately. We need uh, to use uh, short-term traffic incidents to predict short duration of short-term uh, short, uh, term traffic incidents. Uh, there is a different situation for um, data set San Francisco. The best performing model <coughs> is um, by majority of experiments is YGBM. And only in two experiments, uh, extra boost outperforms other models. And uh, for this data set, we have um, significantly small maybe. <coughs> for example, for A2A, uh, scenario when we use short term traffic incidents, it's only 12% of MAPI. And for auto regression, when we use all the data to predict on all the data, it's only 35%. But, um, uh, we also tested performance of machine learning methods like uh, Future Boost, and we see that. Uh, there is very little effect on uh, of number of iterations of randomized search on uh, performance of these models, uh, except XG boost. It uh, appears to be sensitive to number of iterations. And also the most slowest model is random forest and KNN. We see that uh, for KNN uh, greatly has greatly increased computation time, uh, probably because of size of the data set. What factors can affect the incident duration? <clears throat> we try to analyze feature importance, uh, their impact on uh, predicted traffic incident duration on each data set using uh, the best performing model is Visual Boost. And we see that hour of day has uh, the highest impact for arterial road Sydney. It also a significant feature for M7 motorway. And uh, uh, one of the significant features for San Francisco. Also, temperature west row for arterial roads and uh, month's index uh, is the most significant uh, feature for San Francisco, which may point on seasonal dependence of traffic incident durations. Uh, we use two outlier removal methods for outlier uh, removal for regression modeling. First is isolation forest. It's a very simple outlier removal method, which uses forests of random split trees. For each tree, method randomly selects feature and uh, random feature value until every data point becomes isolated. So if we randomly selected feature Y and point became instantly separated, it uh, may point that this is an outlier. For local outlier factor, it's uh, not a Outlier removal method, which estimates anomaly score from local deviation of density in relation to neighbors. <clears throat> I propose the following method, uh, which called uh, extra uh, intra extra joint optimization. We combine for uh, well, we combine parameters of the regression model and outlier removal method to form one hyperparameter space for optimization and call it uh, joint optimization. We utilize randomized search for hyperparameter tuning and extra joint optimization represents joint model and outlier removal tuning using application of outlier removal before cross-validation cycle for all the data as you see on the plot. We apply outer removal, and then uh, only then we perform cross validation cycle to find best hyperparameters and uh, to 
uh, use this hyperparameter uh, hyperparameters to pre make predictions on test set. Interjoint optimization is a bit different from extra joint optimization. It's a joint model and auto removal tuning with application of auto removal within cross validation cycle for every fault split. So hyperparameters for auto removal method will be tuned to have common parameters for different possible subsets of data. So uh, I did this because we can have different distribution of traffic incident durations, different sets of uh, traffic incidents when we obtain new data and we will try to predict on it. So if method will be adapted to different combinations of these uh, data sets, uh, it will be more optimal. This is my hypothesis. These um, results uh, for regression using intra-extra joint optimization <coughs> and also work transformation of incident duration vector. <coughs> Um, so we can see for data set arterial roads that uh, application of work transformation to incident duration vector is um, significant, has significant improvement on accuracy of predictions. For example, for random forest, it was 121% maybe. But after application of work transformation, it became 80%. And for all other methods, it's the same. Work transformation always outperforms uh, unprocessed incident duration vector. The best performing XGBoost model across different scenarios is XGBoost. <clears throat> and when we compare intra and extra approaches, we see that sometimes intra joint optimization outperforms extra joint optimization for example in case of uh, isolation forest uh, <clears throat> application and for um, uh, local auto factor we have uh, different picture uh, extra joint optimization performs better For MCL motorway, we have significant improvement from, from application of work transformation to incident duration vector. It reduces errors uh, almost twice. And also the best performing approach for outlier removal uh, is intra joint optimization using isolation forest for outlier removal. It wins in majority of cases. And for data set San Francisco, we also see the same picture for work transformation. It uh, outperforms all other, um, it outperforms unprocessed incident duration vector. Um, the best performing models are different in this case, like, like YGBM and random forest. And we have competing results for uh, isolation forest and local outlier factor. But in majority of cases, we uh, also see that intra joint optimization outperforms other approaches. It represents majority. Application of the research. Well, old approach was route around traffic incidents to point our route uh, around traffic incidents but uh, by predicting traffic incident duration we can predict that will that it will dissipate by the moment it will arrive at the place at the site of traffic incidents and thus we can plan our route considering that traffic incidents will dissipate thank you Thank you, Arthur, for your presentation and for all your hard work. Um, before taking any questions from the audience, I I do have to say that um, this is um, Arthur is being modest, but 
he actually proposed the new combination of machine learning algorithms, um, which is a combination of all those intra-extra joint optimization plus outlier removal plus selecting best ML models. And this is his achievement so far. And um, uh, hopefully this will be bringing benefits to the entire community. That being said, we have a few minutes for questions before we hand over to the, our next speaker. So if anybody connected today would like to um, unmute and ask Arthur a question, a question, please go ahead. No question? Arthur, I have a question. Um, can you turn to the last slide of your presentation? I thank, by the way, thank you for your presentation. The last slide? Yeah, the last slide. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, the last slide, yes, this figure. Um, so what's the difference between uh, of the, I mean, what's the innovative of the new approach? So you predict when the incident will disappear? and then plan the new route? That's my question. So I don't yes, uh, the approach. In case of uh, current approach is to plan our road around traffic incident. Yeah. Uh, if uh, some uh, traffic section is congested, uh, we can just plan our road around it. But uh, with a new approach, we, we pre uh, plan our road in space and time. So we can uh, when a road, considering that some traffic incidents uh, will disappear, when we are, are uh, we will will be passing uh, section uh, which contains this congestion. I see. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Any other question from the audience or suggestions on how can you make it better? <laughs> That would be really good. Uh, actually, I have a question. Uh, I can uh, thank you for your hard work and the presentation first. Uh, I can see there are many uh, algorithms are used uh, uh, based on tree algorithm, right? Uh, why don't you uh, select some uh, deep learning method uh, or some neural networks to do this job? That's my uh, I try to apply uh, artificial neural networks, but we have very little data. In one data set, we have only uh, 570 uh, cases, and it's just too little to train model. It overfits badly. Thank and <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So sometimes more complicated uh, deep learning methods do not work <laughs> if you have no data. <laughs> Unfortunately, it would be great to have millions of data points and that I think it's the holy grail for all the scientists to explore everything. Yeah, recently there was a countrywide traffic accident data set which contains 2.5 uh, 25 million records of traffic accidents. It's possible to train, uh, to use deep learning on this data set, I think. All right. Uh, I think we have just two more minutes. So only one last question from the audience, if there is one. I can ask one, Simona. Yes, please, Professor. Thank you, uh, Arthur, for the interesting presentation. So my question here is that you have three different data sets um, in your study. Um, what, what is the conclusion that you have from using different data sets? Uh, how, how, the, how do they differ uh, from, from your algorithm perspective and how the threshold for example, because that is one of the problems with her in you, in you, um, uh, algorithm uh, change depending on which data set uh, you use. 
So uh, there is a significant difference um, because there is a significant difference in data sets because they represent different types of uh, traffic network. Uh, and for, uh, for example, for, well, for some data sets, data sets, we can't have the same set of features and uh, number of features is also different and uh, way of reporting traffic incident is different also. Um, it may be a, a big challenge to um, try to unify these data sets, but uh, I don't think that, that it's possible. And also, I think um, our BLEO framework uh, is easily adaptable because it works only with stable data. So it can be applied to any kind of uh, traffic incident reports. Well, uh, for now, without traffic incident descriptions which requires uh, natural language processing. And uh, yeah. yeah, and thank you for your questions, uh, Haibu. Professor Haibu, so the, the main purpose of use of a diverse data set is to verify and validate our some models flexibility and, and some, yeah, flexibility to apply any other some data set to be, yeah, that for future. That is the, the main contribution of the others proposed uh, mathematical framework. Okay, it, yeah, it, thank it, you. Machine learning framework. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting to see that the US, they have different ways of storing their incidents. I mean, the like the, the data is still there, but they have different systems because it's just, um, how should I say? like the outliers that he found around 60 minutes and 360 these are very abnormal for australia like we don't have that like incidents are trying to be closed faster not let them hang for six hours or who knows what's happening right so it's so different from country to country it's very interesting and in australia it also they report zero duration incidents <laughs> it can happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Arthur. Thank you, everyone. It's time to move to our next um, speaker. So um, our next speaker is Bo Wang, and uh, he will present today around the topic of short-term traffic flow prediction in bike sharing networks using 3D REST nets. He received his double um, master's degree in transportation from Monash um, University and Southeast University from China. And currently he's doing his PhD degrees in transport engineering at Monash. And the area is traffic prediction using deep learning. And that's why he asked about deep learning. So I'll pass on to you, Bong, to share your screen. Good. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bo Wang, a PhD student from Monash University, supervised by Professor Hai Wu, Dr. Inhe Kim, and Dr. Chen Cai. Uh, today, my uh, topic is short term traffic, traffic flow prediction in back sharing networks using 3D resonance. So uh, I will first uh, introduce our problems and our corresponding methods uh, when forecasting the traffic flow in back sharing system. Then I will show the results and the discussion based on our experiments. Finally, I will conclude this study. So, so the back sharing system in our research look like this. The whole city is divided in, into many grids. And in each grid, there are several red dots representing the back stations uh, where you can borrow or return bikes. We treat this borrow or return behavior as traffic flow. Uh, and our job is to predict the in and out flow in each grid. For example, we are predicting the traffic flow of this whole area in the future. 
Then our first question is uh, how to select the input sequence or input data for the forecasting model. Uh, because there are many historical time steps uh, available to use, uh, this is uh, different from our previous presentation, previous work. Uh, in normally, the, the simplest way is taking uh, the nearest time step as our input uh, for the forecasting model. And in other research, we can also see some more complex way to select input candidates. For example, we can take previous data hourly, weekly, monthly, or even seasonally together to combine as uh, input data. Uh, we call all these methods as rule-based input selection. Uh, basically, this method pick up input sequence by our experience. Uh, but our experience may not always work for different data sets. Uh, therefore, we introduced uh, autocorrelation for this problem. Uh, the, the idea of autocorrelation is very simple. Uh, assume we have a training data set that contains, contains time steps from 1 to t. Uh, then we duplicated these time steps and generated two identical rows like this. Uh, we put these two identical rows in this way. Remove the last time step in the first row and the first time step in the second row. Uh, then calculate the correlation of the overlapped area, the red area. Uh, as you can see, we are calculating the correlation of their first neighbor. Time step one and two, two and three, T minus one and T. Uh, we, th we say this is the autocorrelation when lag equal to one. Similarly, we can do this job by removing two time steps in head and tail, uh, and so on. Finally, we can get a diagram look like this. Uh, it shows the autocorrelation result with different lengths of, of lag. We can pick up the most positive position as our input sequence or input data, like this way. So the, the second problem is about how to learn spatial temporal features more efficiently. As I introduced uh, uh, before, our input data are multi-grays. Uh, it looks very close to image data. So many existing models select CNN to learn the features from the input data. Uh, there are typical models like uh, VGG, Resonite, Inception, and so on. Uh, however, most of them are using 2D kernel, which means you can move this kernel uh, only across two dimensions. Uh, in our case, it will move through uh, latitude and longitude. Uh, all temporal information are treated as, as, as channels in C, uh, 2D CNN. Therefore, in our work, we use 3D kernel to make this movement more flexible. Uh, the kernel by creating a 3D kernel, uh, it can move through the time step, latitude, and the longitude, three axes. Uh, in this way, more comprehensive spatial temporal features can be learned. This is a, a complete structure of our forecasting model. The input data have four dimensions. Uh, time step, flow types, and uh, uh, width and uh, height of the study area. This model uses 3D kernel to capture the spatial temporal features. Uh, 
and use 3D uh, residual blocks to increase the depth of the model as well. So in the next section, let's see the results based on the two back-sharing uh, back datasets and our proposed methods. The first data set is come from New York City, which has eight by 16 grids. And the other data set uh, is from Suzhou City in China, uh, 28 by 20 grids. First of all, uh, we performed the auto correlation for our training set. Uh, the first figure shows the traditional way we select the input sequence. Uh, we pick up three nearest time step and the time step three days ago and four days ago. Uh, however, by using autocorrelation, the result uh, is a little bit different. In the New York data set, the target time step is kind of evenly distributed uh, through the previous months. But the result of Suzhou data set is more concentrated uh, near to the target. Therefore, uh, for different data set, their optimal input data could be different. Uh, and the color uh, in this last two diagrams representing the co correlation between input data and the target. This kind of like the weight of our input data. Uh, we haven't utilized this weight information in this work, but this could be also an interesting research direction in the future. Here are the results of our evalu evaluation on testing sets. First, uh, comparing to the traditional rule-based uh, method, the input provided by autocorrelation can gain more accurate prediction. Second, uh, compared to the 2D CNN or other baseline models, the proposed 3D resonance performed better. The numbers here are the average error of the testing set. And we also calculate, calculated the error in different hours. We found that all forecasting models have two performance bottlenecks during uh, peak hours. Uh, this may be caused by bad, bad model structure design uh, or the common problem for all existing models. Um, furthermore, this may be caused by less training samples during this period. Uh, apparently, peak hours uh, has more uh, has less training samples compared to other hours. We have further visualized the learned features in 2D and 3D CN models. The learned features are more concentrated and clear by using 3D kernel. Uh, by comparing the rule-based and autocorrelation-based uh, input methods, we can see that the autocorrelation-based uh, method further enhances the uh, feature learning. The learned features, uh, the boundary of learned features is more clear and less noisy. Based on the previous results, we have visualized the prediction and the observation in different hours. Uh, they look uh, pretty close, which means our prediction is accurate. Based on the difference between flow in and flow out, we can create another diagram look like this. We call this difference uh, as the writing demand. Uh, the green areas have more returning than borrows, which means we should uh, transfer the bags from green areas to the red areas to make the balance of the back sharing system. Uh, we believe this application can be helpful for, for the management and operation in back sharing systems. 
Finally, let's conclude this work. This study focused on a short-term traffic flow prediction problem for back sharing systems. We proposed a new deep learning framework with improvement in both the structural and the input aspects for traffic prediction. Results show that the proposed 3D resonate model could capture the spatial temporal features. And our proposed input selection strategy offered a systematic way for sel selecting optimal training inputs. These two methods both contributed to further overall forecasting improvement. And uh, uh, this work has been published in Journal of uh, Intelligent Transportation Systems early this year. Uh, please have a screenshot if you are interested. Uh, welcome to read our work for more details. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentation and for your interesting work around the bike sharing services, which I think uh, I, it's funny to see that you have external data sets from other countries that are embracing the car sharing system, but Australia is lagging behind. So we need to catch up with, with the bike sharing systems in Australia, because I think there's a true potential. Um, all right, so let's take some questions from the audience, because you had some interesting things that you have presented. Would anyone want to unmute and ask Paul some questions? Okay, so thank you for your very good presentation. So yeah, congratulations on your publication. So I have a question about the, the definition of short term. So that yeah. can you explain more about the time window you used in this publication, in this research? Uh, in this research, we selected two uh, back sharing data set. Uh, for Suzhou, I think the time step, the minimal time window is five minutes. So uh, in this research, we can also predict uh, multiple steps ahead. So in that way, we can do some scheduling stuff. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, so it could be very useful to design bicycle redistrib redistribution plan in bike sharing problems. So yeah, thank you, it's a big contribution. That, that's a good point, because uh, you, you've noticed, right, there are some areas where there are an accumulation of bikes and other areas where they're more empty, right? So that could be super useful. Yep, anyone else? I just have a comment rather than um, a question. Um, yeah, it, it's great talk, Bo. Uh, my, my comment is that uh, the work is for by sharing system, but uh, uh, it could be relevant to any other sharing system, such as um, car sharing or even uh, electrical vehicle for charging. So you, you could see the similar application where you could potentially predict uh, the demand uh, in terms of uh, the number of uh, shares of a unit or, or in terms of charging, then obviously in terms of uh, battery swapping, for example, you, you might want to using the same technique to predict uh, in the short term that whether you have enough uh, battery to swap or not. So, so I think the, the applicability is, is beyond that car sharing um, uh, given, yeah, as long as you have the data, uh, I think you could apply the similar uh, methodology. Um, I would also like to ask you both with regards to the patterns. So you, the way you embedded your, your patterns of by flows in and out of those areas is by doing the autocorrelations right in time. Uh, I was just wondering, have you thought about building your daily patterns in and out uh, from all historical data 
and then doing a sort of mix and match based on profiling, like type of day, day of the week, whether it's holiday, whether it's not holiday. So all these characteristics of the day where you have data, have you tried of comparing to, to that one as well? or? Uh, well, uh, we haven't tried uh, in that way. Is that means we introduce uh, more features in the input? You can, yes, you could. Yeah, we, uh, we haven't do that because we want to compare the, our autocorrelation with traditional methods purely. Uh, but in the future, we can compare, we can add more uh, external features like weather or day of uh, day of the week, some some information of that to see if the uh, accuracy is improved. Yeah. And the daily profiling of your day, that would be fantastic to see. Yeah. Thank you for your suggestion. Anyone else? From the audience? If no more questions, I think we can move on. We'll be ahead of time, which is good, <laughs> saving everybody's time. Um, so let me just share my screen to introduce our third presenter. So um, Sihyun is currently a lecturer in UTS and he, um, prior to being with us, he was working in the University of Canterbury and then University of Hong Kong, where he completed his PhD degrees. He has an impressive number of publications in Q1 journals, also reviewer for all the top Q1 journals in translation science. And he's mainly interested around traffic management control, the traffic flow theory, ITS, deep learning, connected vehicles, and so on. So I would like to welcome him and uh, share his presentation for today. Yeah, Shimona, thank you. So I will share my screen. Yeah, uh, good morning. So I'm Singhyun, working at Future Mobility Lab. Uh, of uh, UTS. So today I will present a stochastic behavior model of personal mobility devices under, <coughs> sorry, under mixed traffic conditions. So this is a collaboration work with the Monash research team, Dong and Nam, and also uh, at, uh, South Korea University team. It's uh, Aju University team's uh, Professor Dichol. So, can I change the pointer? So this is the content. I will give a simple introduction first and then deliver research review to find research gaps and contributions. And then I will describe a mathematical framework and case study in the following sections. And I will give a discussion and future direction in the section of conclusions. So introduction. So that is the definition of uh, personal mobility devices. We can call that TM in this study. Uh, so that is a definition in Queensland. Uh, PM must be used by a single person only, and the maximum speed is 25 kilometers per hour, and the weight should be below 60 kilograms. And PM should be powered by electric motors, and this is the acceptable size of personal mobility devices. And it has a one or more wheels with the braking systems, and it should be safe device as itself, of course. So the public use of the personal mobility is not permitted in New South Wales and South Australia, Western Australia, but in Victoria, Queensland, Tasmania, and Northern Territories, uh, public use of personal mobility is allowed. So the public use has a different meaning in each state, but general means sharing devices of PM devices like Rhyme service in North America and New Zealand. But transport for New South Wales already recognized the potential benefits of new personalized devices for short trips 
in the future transport strategy 2056. So we construct these challenges for comprehensive reviews of the current issues. So how can we, uh, how can you understand behavior of person mobility to resolve the current safety concerns? And how can you model behavior of personal mobility under heterogeneous flow, including pedestrians and bicycles? So can you consider riders uh, stochastic characteristics on the proposed model so that with these questions, we narrow down our questions to this. Can our, more, can our previous model put as multi-range stochastic optimal velocity model invented by Dong uh, explain stochastic behavior of personal mobilities? So the research aims are to develop stochastic behavior model of personal mobility devices under heterogeneous traffic conditions in a single shared lane based on car following theories, which are the mature studies to define dynamics of moving objects like vehicles in the designated lane in the area of traffic engineers. So it involves to identify characteristics of personal mobilities under a mixed traffic environment and to introduce a stochastic volatility derived from the behavior of personal mobility to a SD stochastic differentiation. So literature review. To date, uh, dynamics of personal mobility devices had not received that as much attention as that vehicles, uh, such as macroscopic models mainly dealing with uh, vehicular traffic flow characteristics at the low level details, such as density, such as relations between density, speed, and flow. And also microscopic modeling illustrating the dynamics of traffic flow at the high level of detail, including the behavior of each individual vehicles. So we reviewed stochastic car following models and the current behavior models of low carbon transport modes, including pedestrians and bicycles, to define research purposes and contributions. So this is the simple summing up car following theories. There are three major car following models, OVM, IDM, and F FVDM. And stochastic characteristic, characteristics of drivers are introduced in traditional Covering models by diverse forms of in the past decades. But George Lavo developed a parsimonious model for oscillation in coupling models, and our previous studies were totally following his approach. But the contribution of the, our previous studies were to guarantee non negative property of stochastic parts by introducing range of equations and consider range changing maneuvers under multi-lane traffic flow conditions. So for low carbon personal transport mode, uh, yeah, uh, diverse, diverse uh, research approaches have been proposed to investigate the, the behavior, of, behavior characteristics of sustainable uh, personal transport modes but only for pedestrian bicycle for the last several decades. In the meantime, there, are, there is a plenty of rooms for modeling micro behavior dynamics of personal mobility devices, which mainly defined e-scooters and e-bikes, unlike that of uh, pedestrians and bicycles until recently. But most of studies include simulation-based approach and social force model of pedestrian behavior and pedestrians' perceptions toward personal mobility. So the research purposes, the research purposes are to create stochastic heterogeneous personal mobility device following models and to, and to tackle unpredictable fluctuations in the velocity of personal mobility devices. And there are two primary contributions of this study as follows. The first one is uh, we can introduce uh, stochastic volatility, uh, which is which is explained by the range bank force in the proposed behavior model, and also we can introduce uh, anticipation factors defined by, defined by a degree of uh, 
influence of sp space headway and relative speed to the reading modes on the on the following uh, personal mobility devices. So mathematical framework. So this is the conceptual figure to explain dynamics of personal mobility is on a single shared lane in the proposed mathematical framework. Uh, that is the personal mobility devices and green with the green bikes and the brown people. So N is the number of personal mobilities and M is the group of low carbon transport mode. And T is the number of time steps and X is the number of X denotes the position of devices, and V denotes the speed of devices, A denotes the acceleration of devices, and S is the space headway to the reading devices of device N. So uh, first of all, we propose anticipation factors to define a level of recognition of the personal mobility devices toward the leading personal mobility to capture the non-lane disciplinary behavior of the personal mobility in a shared lane. Uh, this is the general acceleration equations of vehicles normally defined by coupling models, including speed and space headway and the acceleration profiles. So we use the partial average space headway and relative speed of personal mobility N which are delta and lambda, delta and lambda, and with, with regard to all the reading personal mobility devices in a single lane as below these equations. So that the summation of anticipation factors should be one for each delta and lambda. And then we use the range of equations to describe the stochastic personal mobility behavior model under heterogeneous traffic conditions. So we need to extend the range bank method proposed in our previous, previous works to define dynamics of personal mobility as follows. So here is the comprehensive equations of a stochastic behavior model. The first term is for the deterministic part, which could be explained by OVM and FVDM, including anticipation factors. And the second term is for the range bank force, which, defined, which defines the random deviations from the mean speed of uh, individual scooters consisting of increments of the standard final process and the positive speed dependent dissipation parameters. So this dissipation parameter it depends on the speed speed profiles and the noise strength coefficient to prevent negative variance in stochastic part. So in the case study, uh, we designed and conducted this experiment in South Korea for model calibration and validation for dynamics of personal mobilities. It looks like very similar to the traditional circuit experiment for car models and effectiveness of autonomous vehicles in the satellite. So it was uh, carried out on May of 2019, and the cir circumfer circumference is uh, 120 meters, and the road width is uh, 1.50 meters. So we designed, uh, we designed four initial states of traffic flow, uh, three pedestrian working, and three bicycles running, and three personal mobilities running below 10 kilometers per hour, uh, which is low speed conditions. Uh, three personal mobilities running over 10 kilometers per hour, which is high speed running conditions. Uh, personal mobility riders is advised to participate in and escape from the traffic main, tra main traffic streams in the circle in every two minutes and we can keep the standard to maintain the maximum number of moving scooters in the circle as a 10 because of safety issues. And also personal mobility riders are advised to find their own gap acceptance against the mainstream in the circle. 
So we collected digital images from the drone device to extract all trajectories in the circle. So there are four experiments, uh, scooter's behavior under mixed traffic with uh, three bicycles and three pedestrians. And the fast, fast and low speed low speed running homogeneous traffic streams. Uh, density, uh, density was changed from the 25 uh, objects per kilometer to, to 83, 83 objects per kilometer for each experiment. Uh, this table include each time duration for each density under four different conditions. So we, we describe the speed profiles of pedestrians and bicycles and personal mobilities for four different conditions. The first one is a bike mixed flow conditions. Uh, three, three bikes are running at the initial conditions and then seven personal mobilities are participated in the mainstream per every two minutes. The second one is a pedestrian mixed traffic flow conditions. Uh, three pedestrians are working at the initial conditions and then eight personal mobilities uh, participated in the mainstream per every two minutes. The third one is uh, low speed running conditions and there are three initial running personal mobile devices. And that is the la last one is the high speed running conditions so with the three initial running personal mobility devices. So we conducted a uh, model calibration and validation and then provide a uh, comprehensive results comparing the observed and the estimated trajectories. Uh, in the calibration process, we compared, uh, compared the performance of all five models uh, described in this table. So from models, from models one to five, uh, we changed the model parameter symbol in. Uh, in this table, model the second model is the SOVM we proposed in the, our previous paper papers, and the model four is the original FVDM, uh, one of the widely used uh, coupling models. Uh, this model five is what we propose in this study, including anticipation factors and stochasticity and relative speed. So we compared the performance of the five models using trajectories of just one single personal mobility under four different conditions. And then we selected the best model to validate its performance using all trajectories of personal mobilities under four different conditions. At the final stage, we compared the observed and the estimated comprehensive flow of personal mobilities under four different conditions. So uh, in the calibration section, we calibrate the four models. We calibrate the four models described in this table with the, the calibrated means and standard deviation under bike mixed conditions. And then the observed trajectories are compared with the mean value with the 95% deviations in this figures. And then we compare the final values of the genetic algorithms of five models and the model five outperformed other models of the bike mixed condition. And also for pedestrian mixed conditions here is the calibration result and then the ground truth uh, trajectories are compared with the mean value and deviation in these figures and the model five also outperformed other models on the pedestrian mixed conditions. For low speed and high speed learning conditions, the model five also showed very good uh, performance. And also in high speed condition also showed a very good performance. So we make a conclusion in introducing anticipation factors and stochastic city to the framework of the Every DM was uh, very successful to define uh, dynamics of personal mobilities under heterogeneous and homogeneous flow conditions. 
So we describe the final validation results of the Model 5 using all personal mobility trajectories under four different conditions. Uh, this small graph denotes the calibration results of the Model 5 using the first and third and fifth and seventh personal mobility devices. But these bigger three graphs denotes validation results of the fifth, uh, the Model 5 using uh, the second and fourth and the sixth uh, personal mobile devices. So yeah, model five show the excellent performance in both calibration and validation data sets under all different uh, traffic flow conditions. And then finally, we, there are some comparisons between the observed and the estimated comprehensive flow of personal mobilities under four different conditions. Uh, under bike mixed conditions, yeah, the, the trajectories of a personal mobility are fluctuated and also, but the performance of model five is also excellent. And also under pedestrian mixed conditions, and also model five show the excellent conditions, but there are some fluctuations when there is some pedestrians in the circle. But low speed, homogeneous low speed conditions and high speed conditions, the model five showed the stable and stable performance and performed better than perform better than heterogeneous flow conditions. So conclusions. Uh, in discussion, we propose a novel approach to explain the stochastic characteristics of personal mobility in a single lane based on the framework of covering models. Uh, anticipation factors tackle unpredictable fluctuations in the velocity of the personal mobility devices against uh, relative speed and space headway to surrounding low carbon modes under heterogeneous traffic conditions. And stochastic volatility was explained by the range bank force uh, in the proposed behavior model. So in contributions, the finally proposed SFVDM stochastic full velocity difference model based behavior model of personal mobility devices can capture the mainstreams of speed and tiny fluctuations in speed within the lower and the upper bound of personal mobility speeds. But it requires more uh, parameters than the de deterministic personal mobility behavior models. And the stochastic following models uh, applicability describes the personal mobility devices behavior dynamics under mixed traffic conditions using anticipation factors. And also constructing effective regulations and safety standard could be considered uh, to design the traffic facilities for shared, for shared lane through traffic micro simulation programs, including the newly proposed personal mobility behavior models with the pedestrian and bicycle behavior models. So we have three future research direction. Uh, we will introduce retro components of the interactions to tackle frequent overtaking behavior of inter and intra modes in wider pathways to improve the model performance under uh, real mixed traffic conditions. And also we introduce delayed responses to capture physical oscillation of personal mobility devices under mixed traffic conditions. And also forming the platoon of sustainable transport modes is also promising under heterogeneous flow conditions. So thank you, you, you uh, thank you for your some attentions, and you can re you can read a full manuscript uh, in my personal website. And thank you. So thank yeah. you, thank you, Sunshine, very much for uh, the presentation and for modeling new personal mobility um, modes, which as uh, it aligns perfectly with what Bong is also doing, trying to encourage more green and more diverse modes of in our daily commute. Um, are there any questions from the audience with regards to the presentation?
if you can unmute and so maybe i can ask uh, one yes. question first yes. thank you sailing on for for an interesting presentation um my so this this the two questions that I have, the first one is more of the, the scope. Uh, I understand here you, you looking at the, the car flowing or the motor in the mixed traffic, but uh, basically it is uh, that one direction, is that right? So uh, do, you, do, you have, do you have bi direction in this, in this lane or you that looking at one direction? Yeah, it's uh, just a uh, one direction. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And 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 in the in the test that you um you have uh, with your colleague in Korea, that is also the doing in one direction. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That that wondering because if doing this kind of test is quite um uh, a lot of effort. Um, did you actually thinking at that time to actually doing both? scenario where uh, you know because it's, it's the same where well, it's a little bit more effort but maybe you could actually have much more richer data yeah yeah but you did not do that <laughs> no okay yeah. all right okay my second question is that uh, in your literature review you your primary focus or from my understanding at least your primary focusing on um, car flowing motor that that for uh, four four wheel uh, vehicle is that correct you mean the that for for uh, car uh, traffic basically yeah 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 vehicle traffic yes yeah, so but I believe that there are some literature that cover um, non lane bias, uh, car flow uh, motor. Yeah. Why, yeah. why are you not um, looking at them and, and compare with them as well? Yeah, so uh, that is because our um, designing of our experiment. Uh, yeah, also, uh, yeah, I have idea about the, the non-name based coupling models in the previous some researchers. But yeah, under our experiment circumstance, we, yeah, we only consider some just a three uh, pedestrians and the three bicycles, uh, which are initially working and running respectively so that if we ha if we can have uh, some more pedestrians and the uh, bicycles and personal mobilities, and also we can apply that kind of the some non lane based traffic coupling models coupling models on the our study. But yeah, in this study we just only uh, just only consider some perspective of personal mobility devices toward uh, pedestrians and uh, bicycles. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Any other questions from the audience? Is anybody using the bike scooters in Australia? Do you have one at home? Is anybody using that for work? Yeah, we have two, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, I used to uh, run my bike uh, to uh, to to work, but the now it's, it's too cold uh, mm -hmm. in the morning. So then yeah, I, it's too cold in the yeah. winter. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the summertime I will use the uh, bike scooter uh, again. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it is actually a fantastic way of transportation and. Um, I, I think uh, Amsterdam loves bikes and e-scooters and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. hopefully we'll see Australia. Uh, and just as a side note, I, I was recently told that Sydney is named as the city that hates bikes. And that is so sad. I, I didn't know that because the traffic is so congested and there's like people um, usually avoid uh, taking their bikes, but we have to change that. Yeah. All right. Uh, if no more other questions, 
uh, from the audience. Uh, other questions, or we can we can go to our last speaker. Uh, I think we can move to our last speaker. So thank you very much, Sinhyun, and I will just introduce the last speaker um, from Monash, uh, Humayun. Um, I will not uh, try to, to, to pronounce your family name, it will be very, very hard for me. Um, but um, he received his master's degree in computer science from Sharif University of Technology and is now currently a PhD candidate at Monash, um, mostly interested around uh, network science, circulation theory, and transportation network analysis. So, Humayun, uh, pass on to you for sharing your slide. Thank you. Uh, let me just share the screen. Mm. Well, I should also say that Humayun uh, just submitted his thesis. So, awesome. congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, wish me luck. Good luck. Good luck. We are all wishing you good luck. We know how difficult it is the last one. Sure. So can you see all good. Uh, the slide? Yeah, we, can yeah. see, we can see it, yeah. Sorry, let me fix the view. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Homayun Hamid Muaddam, and I'll be talking about an identification of evolving bottlenecks in transportation networks. Uh, I'm mainly supervised by Professor Haibu, and I'm also co-supervised by Professor Huger Nurn and Dr. Saberi. Uh, today, I'm going to first give you a brief introduction about uh, the problem with congestion and how uh, what's our approach of tackling it and then basically my work is can be divided into two major components first is processing smart card data recorded in public transportation networks and then we use that smart card data to analyze uh, public transportation networks and congestion in them. And finally, I will uh, conclude the presentation with a few remarks. Uh, so the problem with congestion, uh, well, first of all, as we all know, transportation systems are crucial to livability of our cities. And every driver and passenger experiences uh, the problem with congestion during the day. Each commuter had lost uh, more than 120 hours in just uh, rush hour congestion in 2019 in Melbourne. So it's one of the most important factors uh, reducing the efficiency of transportation networks. So, of course, this problem can be addressed in different areas of transportation, policy making, development, and operation of transportation systems. But what we are more interested in is to try to understand the underlying dynamics of congestion to come up with highly effective uh, solutions. Uh, Physics of congestion has been well studied for decades. Uh, we know exactly, well, not exactly, but to a great extent we know, we have different theories about how congestion forms, how it propagates. Uh, but recently there is, there is some attention paid to organization of congestion in uh, network structures, in different kinds of networks. Uh, so our research approach belongs to, to the area of network science. Network science is basically the result of probably three centuries of advancement in graph theory. 
but this has in in the past few decades probably 20 years ago this has met the the rising use of network data and availability of different kinds of data and uh, this uh, led to the formation of this new area network science transportation systems are exemplary instances of network system you have a spatially distributed points that can be represented at network components and these network components are uh, connected to one another via different means of transportations and these can be uh, represented as links in a network so a network will give you a mathematical representation of the system and then we can apply um, different methods in statistical physics and computer science um, to to that mathematical representation of the system so what we're trying to do here is basically trying to do a more comprehensive analysis which can will hopefully provide us with a better understanding of complex uh, dynamics of the transportation networks so the objective of our work here is basically the broad aim is understanding the interaction between congestion and traveling flows in transportation networks so we want to know how different levels of congestion how the organization of congestion slows down passenger flows over the network uh, so we do this by using an enriched representation of on road public so basically what i'm going to present here is is mainly focused on on road public transportation networks so you have bus and tram trans, mm, transportation networks they share road with cars they are uh, in constant conflict with congestion on road so we use these uh, networks because we had the data available for them uh, so basically you have a complex systems so you have the passengers you have the uh, transportation supply the road infrastructure and uh, traffic with uh, gives rise to congestion so the first step is as i said you can make a graph abstraction of the complex the system but this graph abstraction can be enriched with different features that's what we do here so for example we can uh, embed congestion on the links so you have different levels of congestion and different links and then we can have uh, embed the demand between these nodes the uh, the mobility demand how how many passengers want to move from one place to the other place and we can augment all these uh, to the graph representation to make a dynamical network that uh, can actually it's a temporal network so the demand and congestion changes over time so to make this network we use uh public transportation smart card data collected in melbourne and brisbane we have over 120 million records that we use we basically use this to digitally reconstruct the, the public transportation network uh, first by extracting trajectories of every single vehicle on the network uh, using the information available in the data so that will give us the structure and the congestion dynamics on network and then we also want to extract origin destination demand which will tell us how the passenger flows uh, happen on the network so a big famous problem is estimation of od demand metrics that uh, which will give us eventually the the, the passenger flows so we uh, we try to deal with uh, two main problems the first problem is 
missing transactions in the data, which is pretty common in uh, pretty common problem with with uh, smart card data, and then. Uh, we need to uh, find out where passengers do transfers so we can figure out their chain of trips and come up with a better representation of passenger traveling flows. So we actually developed a procedure or uh, a framework, if you will, which the main goal of this, this framework is that it's a parameter-free procedure which does not require too much network specific knowledge and parameter tuning. So this makes it applicable to various smart card data settings. So we basically, the, our framework has three stages. The first stage, uh, it's a lot of data pre-processing uh, and reconstructing vehicle trajectories from the timestamps and uh, locations available in the smart card records. Then we perform our two tasks, two major tasks corresponding to the two major challenges. So estimating missing transactions and also um, trip chaining to get to the OD demand metrics. So we do this in two stages, each one of these tasks. So first, it's exploratory data analysis. So we, mod we try to use patterns in the data to model some behavior and then use that model, deploy it to make our estimations or uh, overcome the other challenge. So the main problem with the quality of our data uh, was missing transactions, but in particular missing scan of transactions in both uh, Melbourne and Brisbane. So what we do, we, I'm not gonna get too much into details, but we, we try to model passengers alighting behavior. So we recognize that passengers have, uh, have different factors when, when choosing where to alight. So we try to extract factors that uh, explain the passenger's behavior very well. And we, we use a simple, rather simple model. We use random forest classifier and we train the classifier on the data so the classifier would be able to model the alighting behavior. Now, when we have a tap on, but we don't have the tap off, we use the model, we have the trajectory of the vehicle, a uh, model can, uh, basically predict which station the passenger will choose to alight and we we will basically reconstruct the missing transaction based on that we also use the same idea we use the patterns in the data that tells us what is the difference between transfer time and activity time so with no parameter uh, we can separate the time spent for transfers between multiple services uh, and activities uh, happening between two trips. So basically with all uh, performing all these tasks, we, we can enhance the data estim by estimating the missing transactions. And when we have all the missing transactions, uh, we use them with the available ones, of course, and then we link the trips that are, uh, well, we, we do the trip chaining, which is basically putting, uh, attaching trips together if they're linked by a transfer. And that will give us uh, all the demand metrics of the network. When we have this chain of trips, we just take origin and destination. We want to know between each origin destination pair, how many passengers are traveling at some snapshot in time. So these are just two uh, visualizations of what we get at the end. So here in Melbourne, we have the origins, the, the size of the node is representing how many passengers are starting there. And we have the destinations here. You see the CVDs 
pretty obvious. And so here's another representation. This is the, the, the flows uh, we connected origin destinations, but the color shows the direction. And this shows how from morning to the evening, the direction, the, pass the direction of passenger flows change with respect to CBD. So people are, commuters are going to, to work move towards CVD in the morning and then they go uh, back in the evening. They diverge from the central business district area. So this um, developed uh, framework is presented uh, in a paper in Transportation Part C very recently. And now that we, we have the passenger flows and we can, of course, uh, generate the network from the bus and tram trajectories. <clears throat> we get to the network analysis parts. What we are using, the main tool in our network analysis stage is percolation analysis. So percolation analysis was first used to study mechanics of uh, fluid movement, uh, probably well, 90 years ago. Uh, this has now become a uh, very popular tool in statistical physics and is heavily applied in network science. So the idea is very simple. Uh, percolation simulates removal of components or connections on the network, but it studies the behavior of the network under this process of link uh, node removal. So here's a, a simple representation of the process. You start with a network. Uh, with some strategy, you remove the links or nodes, and then you observe how different properties of the network change as the process goes on. Uh, but what's important is the network's behavior, because mm, the core idea is that the network's behavior under percolation is the product of its properties. So what we do with congestion is that we have a network with different levels of congestion spread over the network. When we mm, perform the percolation process, we do it based on link dynamics. So for example, let's assume we remove this super congested links first, and then progressively we remove a shell of most congested links from the network until we have no links left. So the network behavior here depends on how we monitor it. It can actually reveal how the congestion is organized on the network. What percolation theory does, it allows you to interpret this behavior into, uh, into actually uh, what is happening to the network with congestion or flows or whatever, whatever you're monitoring. So basically the process happens, the strategy is based on link congestion, but the monitoring of the network is, uh, we can choose how to monitor it. But essentially, removing links based on congestion level allows us to view the network at different congestion levels. So what we do here, uh, here you see the public transportation network in Melbourne and Brisbane. This is one snapshot of the network. The color of links show the congestion. Now when we perform the percolation process, uh, we define, we propose our own network property. The network property allows us to understand how much each level of congestion uh, slows down different amounts of passenger flows over the network. Uh, so we do that so we can actually involve the heterogeneity of flow demand and also uh, the organization of congestion is into this uh, network analysis. 
well, without getting too much into details, our network property actually allows us to, so, well, well let, let's imagine this is, this is actually a percolation process on one snapshot of the network. This is our introduced network property. You see it starts at one always and ends up at uh, almost zero. But what we can do, uh, we can actually monitor this and this tells us how reliable the network is. So if, re if different congestion levels slow down the flows uh, heavily, then we will see a quick drop in this uh, sooner in the percolation process. But if heavy uh, congestion actually doesn't affect traveling flows that much, then we don't see a drop in this until the, almost the end of the process. So a good way of aggregating this is actually an integral uh, uh, of this property on affected demand over the percolation process. But what is good about this introduced uh, property is that we can analytically calculate it. So basically you have an algebraic expression. Uh, this R you can find it from the adjacency matrix of the network. And F is basically the, the, the OD demand matrix and everything else uh, is just constants here. And basically you can, without performing any process or monitoring or whatever, you can calculate a measure an indicator of the reliability of the network. So, well, to, to wrap up here, what our reliability measure does, it actually unpacks the organization of congestion, how different levels of congestion are distributed over the network, and measures the conflict between passenger flows and the organization of congestion. So, uh, when, According to our reliability measure, we can actually measure the criticality of each link. So what is important, which is basically our idea, is that how much removal of a link contributes to the drop in, in, in this network property. So we can, uh, we can analytically calculate the criticality of each link. Now, each link, if it's more critical, it means that if we treat the congestion on that link, we help the passenger flows to move around. Uh, we can help them more. Uh, so there are a lot of good uh, stuff about because, because it's, it can be simply calculated algorithmically uh, and so on. But, but the main benefit of of this uh, criticality score is that we can actually link this to the reliability of the network. So when we calculate, when we calculate the reliability, we define the reliability here. Then we want to know how much each link contributes to, to this reliability. We can calculate the criticality like this. But when we put this all together, we can actually show it very simply that this pops up, which basically tells us that criticality of the network is related to the reliability of the network with the congestion level on the link. So one thing that this allows us, this allows us to prove that if you have a link with higher criticality score, if you improve the congestion, so you increase this by treating the congestion, you actually get a more, uh, get a larger boost in reliability of the network. So we can prove this, but the, the uh, application of this is that we can use the links that are more critical to improve the reliability of the network in practice. So here's our, uh, this is the map of uh, Melbourne's bus and tram network, and this is Brisbane. And the color of the links here show the, show the link criticality that we calculated, uh, averaged over time. So you see that uh, basically central CBD, most critical links are focused there, but 
we have uh, highly critical links around major shopping centers in uh, Melbourne and major universities actually. And we see similar stuff uh, for Brisbane. So we reduce the congestion on most critical links, which can be assumed to be the bottlenecks of the network. When we reduce the congestion, we will facilitate the flow movement over the network. We can actually perform numerical simulations and we show that if we eliminate the congestion of the top 2% bottlenecks, the bottleneck links in Melbourne, we can improve the reliability by 23%, but that's hard to interpret. We can actually calculate how much time we save, which is almost 11,000 uh, hours of travel time over a single weekday by just treating 2% of bottlenecks. By the way, the, the most practical way to eliminate bottleneck is uh, congestion on bus and tram bottlenecks is to, for example, separate uh, the bus and tram lines from the road traffic or segregate them. Uh, we published this work in uh, Nature Communications this February. Uh, and okay, from here, I, I just to make two points uh, to conclude the presentation. One is the generality of this theory. The theory that we propose is generally applicable to a variety of uh, different infrastructure networks, communication networks, power grids, and other transportation networks. As long as you have some sort of any phenomenon that slows down the flows moving all around the network, and then you have a certain demand for flow movement between different nodes. So we actually test this on this uh, uh, on these networks, which is uh, they're called random geometric graphs. They have certain properties, but an important property is that they are very well connected in some local communities and they have bridging links between the communities. So when we test it without, without any assumption on, on what the network is, it can be power grid or transportation network, we can actually change how the demand is distributed over these networks. So we test, uh, random demand and we test long range demand. So demand is higher between nodes that are far away from one another. And then we have uh, low range demand. And then we spread some synthetic uh, congestion over the network. We actually show that uh, the criticality score that we introduced totally makes sense when the uh, uh, when the when, when the distribution of the flow demand changes, uh, the critical links totally change. So, for example, the long range demand makes the bridging links very important because they connect local communities that are far away from one another. But when the when the demand becomes short range, the 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 links inside these local communities become more important. So anyway, there's too much to talk about here, but the, the general idea is that we show the generality of the theory on some theoretical network models. And this has a lot of applications, like for example, in power grids, you can rewire power grids to get a better uh, structure that serves the demand and may, probably adding roads in transportation networks or even you can for example consider congestion to be the delay in passengers boarding in train stations and then do the same analysis for uh, train networks and finally uh, we this is some sort of future work that uh, I just wanted to mention is that we use the same idea uh, of percolation analysis to characterize congestion propagation. So we are currently uh, doing a work which is basically 
using percolation analysis to characterize the propagation of congestion and we develop a traffic signal control scheme which dynamically uh, reflects to the propagation of congestion and tries to break down the, conge the congested clusters in the network. We are uh, doing this work with our own uh, amazing Dr. Nan Zhang and of course, Professor Haibu. And yeah, hopefully this will be out, this work will be out soon. Thank you. Thank you, Humayun, and uh, that is a quite well-rounded presentation, I would say, gathering the efforts of several years of work. Um, I think that it, it will generate a lot of interest, and I'm opening now the channel for questions. I also have myself quite a few questions, but <laughs> let's first start with the people that are connected online. Oh, sorry, I stopped sharing. Uh... Give me a second. Yep, sure. Yes. So, uh, from the audience online, anyone would like to ask some questions? Yes, um, Mona. It's your colleague. Yes. Uh, thank you, Homeyun, for your uh, great presentation. Uh, I have uh, just a quick question regarding the uh, the parts of the scan of the missing scan of using the like the random force classifier yeah yeah so uh, my question was what was the the like, kind of the ground truth or the label of your classifier so you, you are trying to predict where the passenger will uh, alight right yes that's true but uh, so you know in in melbourne and brisbane people they are not forced to all the time but yep. usually so in let's say half of the times people actually do a scan off also right yeah so the scan of transaction let's say it's missing for half of the half of the trips oh yeah but you can train uh you can train the classifier on the other half that you have paired transactions yes but the right? so your ground truth is basically uh, based on the per transactions that have both scan on and off. But this is based, but this is of course based on difference. So the, the, the other missing or the existing one are not the same people, right? They are different passenger. Yes. And you, and you don't have a way to determine whether or not, uh, like you don't have an identification of this. You don't, you don't for, for instance, know the ID for a certain passenger over the past year or over the past six months or over the past month, right? Yes, it's we have it. No, we have it. So, but, but we don't, so we don't model a classifier for every single passenger. So basically the classifier is modeling the collective passenger behavior. So, so the, yeah, yeah, using using the, the input signals for your classifier is just like the 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 current location or what other the other signals or features as an input for the classifier. Oh, okay. So that actually gets a little bit uh, well, not complicated, but but lengthy to to explain. But the 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 main idea is that. You, ha you usually have two choices. So this is what we consider. You may want to walk less to your next boarding uh, or next destination, or you want to get there faster. Yep. So we basically find where passengers are stepping on the network. And when they have a missing transaction, we want, we, we basically predict if they want to watch less to their less uh, to their next uh, location, or uh, did I say which one first? They want to walk less, or they want to get there faster. So okay. we basically predict that. Then, based on all the options that they have, because we have these trajectories of bus and tram vehicles uh, and trains, so 
we basically, based on all the choices that they have, we use the classifier to predict us where the final alighting choice will be. Yep. But we don't do it for every single passenger. We do it with all the available paired transactions to model the, 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 the passenger behavior collectively. So for how are you going to evaluate that your predictions are really um, good? Okay, so if you're going to evaluate, so you can do a simple cross-fold val validation. So you have all, all your paired, paired trips, you can mask 20% of them. So you, you assume that you don't have them. Yep. Then you perform your prediction. So that would be your estimation, but you already have the target, but it's masked. You, you didn't use it. Then you just compare the estimation with the target value and you evaluate it. So, so essentially it's a cross validation, not, not, not a, 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 an accurate, you don't have the ground truth for it's, the missing ones. It's, it's super accurate. It's as accurate as it can be. It's a cross-fold validation. Basically, you have it, you, you have the data, you know the truth, ground truth. Well, yeah. it's not really ground. Yeah, I, I have a little bit problem with the concept of ground truth. But you basically have the data, but you assume that you don't have it. So you can use your model so you don't train your model on that part of the data that you're masking. You yes. train the model, you, pr you make your prediction, then you validate your prediction on the part of data that you mask. Then you change this mask. Well, this, all, all of these are in, in I, I, I believe in, uh, with very good clarity, uh, we have it in the paper. Okay. Yeah, I, I would be happy if you if you yeah. have a look at that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Khaled. Anyone else from the audience? Um, I'd also get a question. Um, right. Um, it was pretty similar with the uh, with the one Khaled mentioned. So I'm just uh, wondering about some modeling techniques. Are you um, focusing on the stop by stop um, travel demand only, right? So it's not about zone to station. Uh, so just for so public transport, for example. Mm -hmm. So you're not consider like, okay, there's a passenger produced from an area, which is a, um, let's say, residential area mm -hmm. and then wanted to make a decision to get to a public transport station for this um process is it included in your research or not yeah but no that's outside the public transportation system right <laughs> but i think because you also focus on the transfer so when people arrive at at this alighting at a bus stop and yeah. you're going to transfer to other routes. Yes. So the people either stay at the same stop or walk to the nearby. Oh, okay. So we, Are we, you consider that? Well, we have the, we have the data on, uh, we just see the passengers when they are in the transportation, in, in, the, in the system. So mm -hmm. we see one trip, when we see, then we see the consecutive trip. But what we are interested in, in, well, uh, we try to characterize the length of transfers and activities. Of course, you can. Well, this is this is a common uh, practice. You you try to make it find a threshold that below that threshold, uh, the interchange time is associated mm -hmm. with a with a transfer. Above that is an activity. But of course, the, 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 the idea is not the best idea because you, you, you sometimes can do, you can get a quick coffee or something or do a quick shopping and that would be, that might take less uh, than, than a um, long transfer. But what we do, we, we try to actually find, uh, we try to characterize then again, it's too much details, but, but, the, but the idea is that we try to separate 
transfers and activities. We try to label them first, mm -hmm. then separate them, then see what is the different uh, the, the difference between the distribution of transfer times and the distribution of uh, activity durations. When we have these two distributions, then we see a new a new data point. Mm -hmm. We look at these two distribution and try to find out which one this data point belongs to or belongs better to, mm -hmm. uh, fits better. So then we, we decide if that's a transfer or that's an activity. But actually this is not, the, we actually do this simply. I, I, I think in our, in our paper, our full, because, because that's a bigger problem with our data, the missing transactions. And yep. that, that procedure is much more uh, rigorous and, and can be validated. This, it's, we don't really validate it because we didn't have the data available to do that. Mm -hmm. I understand. Thank you. So it's, it's more based on single trips instead of trip Well, yeah, you have your passenger, you have consecutive trips, and then you mm -hmm. try to figure out what, what, what happened between the trips, but only okay. from the data available in, from, sure. uh, from the transaction records. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Oh, and there is another minor question. Like, how do you uh, connect the vehicle network with the public transport network? Are you consider the car and trucks as a um, parameter, impact parameter to the public transport network? What, 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 what do we consider as a parameter? Uh, sorry, are you consider the vehicle demand? Like the car, the flow of car down the road. No, no, As number of passengers. Number of passengers. You you ask what we consider as the demand. Sorry, uh, my question is, uh, how do you connect the car and trucks demand? Oh, okay, okay. To public transport demand. Ah, oh, okay. So so two separate things. We have yeah. the transportation supply structure. Oh. So what we do, because mm -hmm. we have the vehicle, so in every transaction, we know which vehicle this transaction was done on it, and we know what time. So mm -hmm. we try to basically see how each vehicle move uh, over, the, over the network. Mm -hmm. So this is only for vehicles. Then basically right. two consecutive stops in a route, you have two nodes, and then, then they are connected with a directed link. So the bus mm -hmm. goes from stop one to stop two, we have a link mm -hmm. there. Yep. So now you have the supply uh, structure, then passenger demand, we, we calculate that separately. That's our OD demand metric. So mm -hmm. where a passenger starts, where the passenger wants to end up at the end. Okay, oh good. Thank you. Um, yes. Um... Anyone else from the audience? I also like to follow up on what Dong said. I think, so there are a few question points. Maybe she didn't formulate them correctly. One is your public transport OD matrix. Is that a bus stop to bus stop? Like one origin is one bus stop? Uh, yes. Okay, so it's stop to stop all the yes. message. Yes, yes, yes. And you put in there bus stops and you also added tram stops? Yeah, bus and tram. So we don't treat them differently. We, the same we treat them the same. But by the way, now that you say it, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I got the question wrong. When, when I think the previous person asked, now, now I understand the question. Okay. Yeah, so it's a uh, stop to stop yes. or region matrix, not area to area. No, it's a stop to stop. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, the other question is because you said that you have the, um, the congestion analysis. So I think probably that's what the confusion comes from. Because in general, when we talk about congestion, it comes from traffic flow data sets. So yes. the question is, do you have as well traffic flow counts in your network? 
No, but what we, what we have actually is that we have a detailed trajectory of all these vehicles. So you have two stops, a bus goes from stop one to stop two, and then you see it over the day at different point in times and different days. So you can actually, it's a link, so it's probably one or two, sometimes three uh, stop uh, road segments. So we have the time that every vehicle spends between these two stops, then we can figure out if, if the trip becomes longer, basically, then you have more congestion there. If the, because yeah. we know exactly how, where, where, yeah. when they start. Is this when, coming when they from end GPFS? Up Sorry? Is this coming from the GTFS? Start no, just from the smart car data. Because GTFS tells you what the schedule times are. What and real time location as well. Oh, not in Melbourne. Not in Melbourne. Okay. No, in Sydney, probably. But not in Melbourne yet. I think they want to do that. But, <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, Sydney is ahead. So what you have, because you see every transaction on the bus, basically, this is the basic idea, but you, you need a bit of cleaning and pre-processing here. But the basic idea is passengers are tapping on the, on the bus. The last tap on, on a stop I would be the departure time. The first tap on or off on a stop J would be the, the arrival time at stop J. Yeah. All right. That's very good to know. And just one last question. Is your public transport OD estimation algorithm available for other students to use in their research studies? Well, yeah, it is. Well, we, that's what we really try to do. Well, it got a little bit, in my opinion, well, we wanted to do it even more simply so it would be practical, like everyone can use it easily. But quite honestly, the reviewers didn't allow us. But anyway, we, we tried to, then it became too very long. We wanted to make it shorter so it can be easily used. But the, the paper is very long, but we tried to explain every single detail that you need to implement it. So the algorithm is not available? No, it is. It is complete. Oh. Everything is available. So I'm, I'm just saying it's okay. now, it's even too long. The paper is very long because we explained every detail, the algorithm, the, but do you mean the code or? Yes, yes. yes. Oh, the code is, well, it's not available there, but anyone can contact me and I, I'll make it available. Okay, that's really awesome. Thank you so much. Of course. All right. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question in page 13. So I was just wondering what the meaning <coughs> of eliminating the congestion is. Sorry, uh, 13 here? Yeah, 13. So that in the third point, you said that eliminating the congestion of the top 2% bottleneck links. Yeah. So that uh, what the meaning of uh, eliminating the congestion uh, yeah. is. So, uh, uh, I, uh, I thought I mentioned it. So what we mean is, so you, you have the, we have the data from, from the past. So there is some sort of congestion on the link, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But here's our simulation, how, how our simulation works. So mm -hmm. we assume that you don't have any congestion there. So it's a numerical simulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that well, in your simulation, well, in so practice, how, yeah. So what does it mean in practice? In practice, it means, you have the, when you have congestion, it means that your bus is uh, sharing the road with the, with the traffic. Mm -hmm. Now, if you give the bus a separated lane, mm -hmm. then the bus doesn't, is not oh, okay. affected. So okay. assuming, assuming that you eliminate, uh -huh. it means that, well, yeah, you have, you have measures to take to do that, uh -huh. separating or segregating yeah. bus or tram, but yeah. we do this synthetically. So we, we just assume that we, we eliminate the congestion there and then yeah. we, we, we try to see what happens to the flow. Yeah. Or, yeah, so that means eliminating the congestion means change some bus routes uh, to avoid okay. traffic congestions, right? Yeah. One, okay. basically. Yeah. Thank you. So between these two stops, mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you make it separated, segregated, then, well, 
Yeah, we could okay. hope that would be the effect of it. Yeah, thank you. No, it's, it's not so much about chain round, Siung uh, Hoon. It's, it's more about that you, you make the bus flow faster between those two stores mm -hmm. by, mm -hmm. by giving them priority, for example. Yeah. So it's not, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So much interest. See how many people want to know about your work, Ho Mayun. All right. Yeah, that's uh, great. I think we are running out of time. We already uh, passed our finish time for this seminar, but I, I'm glad that people are interested in asking questions and uh, please get in touch with each other. As I said, um, and uh, that, that would be great if you provide emails to, to everyone. So we thank you everyone for, for all your availability this morning, for listening to us, for asking questions and for giving us new ideas. And I will wrap up the session here. This has been recorded and we'll try to disseminate the presentation later on if you guys want to re-listen or just, uh, uh, you know, have more more insights about it. But uh, once again, thank you everyone and have a lovely end of the day ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Simona, for organizing this uh, seminar. So look forward to uh, to meet with you all maybe sometime later of the year again. Yes, that will be really, really good. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you everyone.